Bismillah, assalamu alaikum. I'm going to start with because I remember the question I got before my session by the time the, uh, be my beautiful teachers all um, get theirs. So the question was, if I remember very well, is how do you get education as a woman, Islamic education as a woman, and add to it the usual question of balance? I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I am a working person, I have my in-laws, uh, or I have, my, have my parents, you know, this is all reality. Very few of us here is like, you know, it's only you or maybe you and your husband. So where do you go? Where do you start? Anything you make it a goal and a priority, with Allah's help it will work. But you also have to be realistic, meaning, I am not 18 year old in college studying Islamic studies, I am not. Right, where I have my 16 hours study from day to morning to evening, no. So you put your priorities. What will make you in peace, live in peace, is when you learn that everything you do in your home and at work, as long as it's halal and pleasing to Allah with the right intention is your act of worship. Don't look at cooking to your children as I'm wasting my time. I need to be on my sajada. You didn't get it. Because Allah said, you need to take care of your children and we need to eat. However, having said that, I'm not gonna spend three hours cooking because I'm gonna get tired. So you need to be efficient, put your priorities. And as time changes, you will see more and more time. For example, I always wanted to memorize the Quran, but I was a resident in OBGYN. I did literally 16 to 18 hours a day. Good luck. Absolutely, but I know I want it. And I know Allah will give it to me. Al Yaqeen. And I know He will open the opportunity. So the first thing I did, once I finished my residency, started the journey, half an hour a day. Take, put as what you need to do, including taking care of yourself, of course, and 20 minutes of a study. And what is a study? There is a passive and there's active. You know this way. Passive, you're listening to lectures. Now, this is passive, you don't put much effort. You're listening to a YouTube, it's good. But this is not what will really make you learn. You need to sit down and open that book that you don't like. Tell me about it, right? And then you have to highlight everything that you don't understand. And you have to go and read again and again. And it's a journey. It doesn't happen, it's, there's no Burger King meal in Islamic education. That's how I call it. Yeah, I always say this, you know what? You want to come, order, I want to be a hafidah. Then you come in, pick up, the Quran is in your heart. Doesn't work this way. <laughs> Wallahi. I wish it would be very easy. That's why Allah said, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فينا. It will take time, 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 and sabr, right? As, as Imam Abu Hanifa, it's a beautiful statement he said about his student. I think it was Muhammad al-Shaybani. Um, the meaning, he was giving a fatwa and he was there and the fatwa was not right at the answer. And he was not giving him yet the permission to give the fatwa. So he said to him, you want to be a grape and you have not even yet a small green, husrum, the small baby. Uh, grape, meaning it takes time. And, and this will make you all very happy. If I die, and this is what I said to myself when I started the journey, if I'm gonna die, Allah knows, if he gave me life, I'll continue. And he will reward me as if I finished. Don't give up, be organized, don't waste your time. Woman, woman, don't waste your time. Kitchen, Anything I can do in 30 minutes, don't do it in 35. You're wasting your time. Anything is not necessary, don't do it. Focus, put Allah and Jannah in front of you and see wonders will happen, bi'idhillah. Bismillah. Um, so the question was about, we heard a lot of female companions and how things, quote, should be, and our reality is different. How do we get to the place where we're actually supposed to get? SubhanAllah, first of all, try, don't try to do it alone. Like, you're not the only one that's going through this. Inshallah, we can do it together. 
slow, consistent, steady kindness builds community. Like, mashallah, we were talking about the Rahma Foundation for 10 years every Thursday night. Friday night, sorry, my bad. Friday night, I just moved here in my defense. <laughs> every week, like I remember in my community, we had a 10-year halakha every week. That little drop, one drop at a time, eventually it breaks through the rock. SubhanAllah, so that's one thing. But the other thing, just talking, because we mentioned about talking, sorry, having more than one person doing it together. Do you guys know the ayah in the Quran that says two female witnesses? For years, and I was like, yeah, Allah, but why? I never quite understood it until I was sitting on the board of the masjid. And every time the men would get into like a big ego fight of who's more manly, they didn't care that I was sitting there. When we were figuring things out and we just need to get stuff done, we were just getting stuff done. But when it turned into an ego fight, I was invisible. And every time I would sit there and I'm like, yeah, Allah, if only I had another woman. And suddenly clicked in my head and I was like, okay, this is a situation where she's far more likely to get dismissed. If people are fighting over the money and it's a big deal and they were supposed to write it down because that's what the ayah is telling you and they didn't write it down and now they're bringing these witnesses and there's one woman and there's one man who are like, do women know anything about money anyway? Right? We all know this. We've all been in meetings where you're like, let's get lunch. And then Bob says, let's get lunch. Everybody's like, great idea, Bob. <laughs> and if you say, I said, let's get lunch, you'd be like, okay, but don't be petty, really. Like, who cares about getting the credit, right? But then you have a second woman that's literally there to echo what you said. The women in the Obama administration used to do this. They called it echoing. So Sakina's my friend. Sakina says, let's get lunch. I immediately respond and say, Sakina just said, let's get lunch. Whether I agree with it or not, that's not the point. The point is I'm literally lifting up my sister's voice. And we keep doing this. كم من فئة قليلة. How often has a small group changed something big? Also, غلبت فئة كثيرة. Like overcome a larger group, but also the reality is the vast majority of people want a healthy community where their families can thrive, where their children can thrive. It's usually just one person that's just yelling louder than everyone else. We don't have to yell at people. Them. Anyways. Organize yourselves. Just, just, I loved what she said, but those of you, because many of you came, says we listened to you on Tuesday. Tuesday program started 2000. Seven women in the masjid only. One of them was me. And see where you are. Exactly, I loved it. Persistent, drop by drop, don't give up. And, and don't forget the most important factor. Allah will help you. If your intention is pure, wonders will come. Well, since we're talking about taking things one step at a time, I'll use this question, I'll take this question next, inshallah, which is about um, exactly the same kind of thing. Let's say that there was an ideal Muslim state in 2020. Ha, mashallah, sorry. <laughs> but let's just say, right, theoretically. What would a woman be able to do to be the state head or the finance minister? All right, now you remember earlier I shared about as Shifa, right? Shifa al Adawiyah, who was the first finance minister in Islam. Okay? Now, the question here is what would it take? What would it take for such a thing to happen? Now, this could be a whole lecture in itself, but what else does the question say? It says, How is it possible for her to have such a high position and responsibility while having Islamic responsibilities like taking care of children? Then I realized. I didn't tell you in her biography, she has a long biography. Speaking of long biographies, mashallah, I didn't share with you that in fact that she was married. In fact, she married twice. And that she did have children and was a mother as well. People want to know these details because they matter, <laughs> right? And because it adds multiple layers to who she is and how what the question is asking here, how do you balance this? Okay, let's, let's finish the question, then I'll come to this. It said, if I understood you correctly, that woman should ask help from her husband and her family. But if she's neglecting her Islamic responsibility, is she res neglecting her Islamic responsibilities in taking such a high level position? It depends. No, I'm not talking about Shifa, I'm talking in general. You're asking me in the current time and age, if a person takes a high level position of leadership, does it automatically mean that she is neglecting her family or shirking her Islamic duties and responsibilities? No. The answer is, it depends. Because she might. 
And she may do very well here, and everybody taps her on the shoulder and applauds her and says, go you, go you, you do you, you do you, you know, all this, all this stuff. <laughs> All right, that's, I'm telling you, this current era is one that says, you go, girl. Whatever you're doing, you go, girl. No, you don't go, <laughs> inshallah, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always. Sometimes, yes, and sometimes, no. Because people can applaud you all they want. But ultimately, is what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala see when he looks at you? This is where the circles of priorities that I was talking about matter. This is why I spent so much time talking about it. Because you know, the book that uh, Sada Maryam was quoting about the woman, the hadith about woman, right? That was banned in Saudi Arabia, subhanAllah, and other places I imagine too, that just quotes the Sahih hadith of Bukhari and Muslim. He says in there very accurately, the, the author, he says, if she, you know, if she masters her circles of priorities, there are no issues with her working in any other of those fields, of those circles. There's no issue. And this depends on each and every person because some people are excellent multitaskers, excellent at multitasking, and others are pretty terrible at it. Some people are terrible multitaskers, but they have a lot of hands helping them, right? It really depends. SubhanAllah. So if a person is taking a high level of responsibility and leadership, it doesn't automatically mean that she's neglecting her family. It may mean that SubhanAllah, Allah gifted her with the ability to be very organized or the ability to have lots of help. Because any person you look at and you say, whoa, how does she do it? Never ask that question because it's never that person doing it alone. There's always a whole, whole team of people to allow that leader to do what they're doing if they really are a balanced leader. Does that make sense? And when they are not balanced, which are, is the case actually of many of our leaders, you start seeing it crop up. You see the house is falling apart. You see the kids are off doing I don't know what. You see the spouse is upset with this. You see this crumbling here and that crumbling there. And you see all kinds of mismanagement, not just in a person, person's personal life, but also mismanagement of the community's time and the community's money and the community's efforts and all kinds of stuff. It all goes together, subhanAllah. So anyhow, I invite us, inshallah, to take inspiration from our role models. And I ask the question in the lecture, and I'll ask it again. Do we question the wisdom of Sayyidina Umar for putting Shifa al adawiya as the Minister of Finance? Would any man or woman today question the wisdom of Umar? He knew she was married. He knew she had children. And he knew <laughs> that she was the master of the fiqh of finances and the master of the person who can go into the souq and say, out with you, you don't know how to do this business transaction properly, and out with you, you are scamming people. He knew who he chose. Why are we questioning this? Inshallah, we get inspiration from that. Barakul Afikum. See how capable we are? We're doing tech right here on stage for you. <laughs> MashaAllah. Yeah, multitask. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. The question I had was about, um, you know, the hadith that I mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, he loves beauty, he is beauty. And then it's kind of a conflict or a conflicting message that we shouldn't emphasize our beauty. So how can we balance that? And um, as my slides, uh, as I, I referenced in the slides, the point of um, you know be uh, focusing or or uh, you know the pursuit of beautification should really be about the inward, right? We want to focus on inward beautification, and that doesn't mean, of course, that we don't take care of our exterior. The Prophet ﷺ was known, if you study his sira, for always looking the best, even though he had very little. He took great care to present himself in the most beautiful way, that you know meant uh, oiling, uh, using oil, using uh, perfume, um, always having you know again just the best uh, presentation, hygiene. Of course, where did we learn how to do? all of these things was from his sunnah. So all of that is to say that, if, yes, we're permitted to um, spend time beautifying ourselves, and even within our marriages, we should, right? This should be a balanced um, 
reciprocated thing between both the husband and the wife. However, if that's all you do, or that's your primary focus, and you place so much of your value on beautification, this is where there's a problem. And in this society, this is the toxic messaging that we're getting as women, that you have to be a certain size, your hair has to look a certain way, your skin has to look a certain way, your eye color, you should be at the gym every day. And you see a lot of women, I was telling them, Actually, the other day, my son and I drove to the supermarket early because we had to get milk, and it was after Fajr. And, you know, we, alhamdulillah, had prayed, and then we stayed awake. So when we left to go get milk, it was still, you know, dark outside somewhat. And so I just, I saw a bunch of people on the street running. There were a lot of activity at, at this time, right? It's a very blessed time, Fajr. But you could see that a lot of the people were up doing what? They were out there focusing on, right, the exterior. Uh, so they were doing their exercise, and then I saw one guy, he was uh, putting something in the trunk of his car, and when he came out, he looked like he had just come from the gym. You know, he just kind of had that gym look. He looked sweaty, red. <laughs> so I was like, he must have just come from the gym, and I said, SubhanAllah, and I told my son, I said, you know, it's amazing that so many people will wake up really early in the morning to go to the gym. They will go out of their way to go to the gym. They'll, they'll wake up from their sleep to do that. They'll wake up from their sleep, right, to straighten their hair for one to two hours. I know people who do this. It is their morning beauty routine to wake up super early so that they get their hot, whatever, you know, their ironing, their, um, what is it called? I totally forgot now. Their flat iron, thank you. Their flat iron ready, and then get their makeup ready. You gotta, of course, shower and do all that, but there's all this beautification, but they won't pray. They don't pray to Allah. They don't, they, they, they just don't pray. So this is where we have it backwards. So the point again is, we are permitted to beautify ourselves, but priority has to be inward beautification, character development, making sure we're ridding ourselves of the diseases of the heart, making sure we're learning and studying the seerah of the Prophet the son of the Prophet implementing that, being people who embody as much as we are able to uh, the, the Quranic, uh, you know, the, the Quran in our, in our words, in our actions. That's real beautification. So I hope that's clear. Alhamdulillah. Oh, yes, sister, are you ready? Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Both for the live. Both for the live. Okay, thank you. All right. I did. I didn't get through all of them. Um, so one, uh, there's uh, quite a few questions, and so one of them was so, asking also about um, in what ways can sisters help the African American community. Um, and African-American Muslims, some that ask a question. And I think that the first piece is, is really self-education, you know, about learning um, the, the history, the gaining knowledge and things like that, so that it can help to change the, um, the narrative that had been given to us, whether it's in school, society, wherever we got the narrative from our own families, is to alter the narrative. And that comes with, um, with retraining ourselves first. And the other piece, too, is that begin to change the way that we may look at our sisters, our African-American sisters, like, um, and, and, and look at that in terms of um, uh, positive aspects that we are contributors to Islam. We're contributors to our community more so um, than we may have thought before. So that part is really important. Um, and there was another question about um, the social justice aspect of it. And I think there's one piece around really um, also being mindful of yourself and your health with really getting into the social uh, justice movement and things like that and helping with the African-American community is being mindful because that, I was speaking with someone earlier who came to me to speak um, before, it can be really draining. Um, when really looking at a lot of those the pressures and the negatives that happen as we focus on focus on Islam, focus on um, Allah, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and our, and our, and our health um, and knowing that we can't do it all, you know, to pace ourselves. Um, so I will hand it over to someone else and then I'll come back around to me to answer some of the other questions. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Oh, sorry. The question is, 
Our local masjid, three of them all run by the same board, don't offer any support for sisters' events. They don't allow us to use the masallahs or conference rooms to hold women's gatherings. What do you advise? How can we facilitate such gatherings with such a big pushback? Many of us have experienced this and others, alhamdulillah, go to MCC, and that is the solution, mashallah. Uh, alhamdulillah, we see, the, we see the marked difference of being able to have, um, you know, going to the masjid and reciting Quran together, having your children grow up in the masjid. It's a very different experience for our children to be able to see their mothers coming and learning and, you know, knowing other women. My husband was telling me that one of his favorite memories of being a kid is just going with his mom and running around the masjid and just experiencing the masjid in that way. And that's very interesting because a lot of us, you know, we're in the women's section and we see children running around and we're like, we can't concentrate on the prayer because there's so much noise. And so there's all these different aspects of, you know, womanhood that that converge into this one space. And when we don't feel like we even have the opportunity to experience that space with our other sisters, of course that's very hurtful. And when you've already spoken to the board and you've already written letters and you've already sent emails and you've gone to the board meeting and you've spoken to the imam and nothing is changing, I would recommend two things, and I know that the scholars here have way better suggestions, inshallah they can give advice. But the first is, don't let go of your connection to the masjid, even though you have pain. And that's been really a journey for myself, and I know many other women who, um, you know, we need to separate the difference between this is the house of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I come here to worship Allah, and this is my, my, my space of um, connecting with other believers and helping my family connect with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then any negative experiences I may have, that's where I go into my sajda. In my sujood, I go to Allah and I ask him to help heal me and help heal my community. And of course, therapy is very helpful, especially if you can work with a Muslim therapist. Maristan is here who can help you process why those things are so hurtful sometimes. So one on a personal level, don't let go of your connection with the masjid. If the masjid is open to women, don't let go of it. The second thing is, they might be open in the prayer hall, but that doesn't mean that they are open to you having social gatherings or religious gatherings. And if you want to hold your halaqa in the masjid, but they're not opening the doors for you, I would recommend two things. One, find an alternative space. It can be your own home. A sister that I know in, um, in Santa Clara holds open halaqa in her backyard. Uh, you know, she, she publicizes it. People know her address. And women come all the way from Berkeley. I think some of the women here even come all the way from Berkeley just to be able to be with other women in, in a woman's backyard. And that speaks to, you know, panel how committed women are to seeking knowledge and being in spaces of worship. So one is finding alternative spaces. But the second is you have power in your masjid. You're, you yourself are a donator or maybe someone you know is. And you can speak with them and say, you know, I would like to donate this amount to the masjid, but it's contingent on women being able to have religious classes in the masjid. So you put that pressure on the board from a financial space that, you know, the masjid is for all of us. Myself, my children are not going to be able to learn if you are literally saying we cannot have Quran halaqas in the masjid. So we are not going to be giving this money here. Instead, we're going to rent a room in a, you know, random facility to be able to have our own halaqas. So either this money goes to the masjid and you allow us to wor worship in the masjid or we're going to rent out a room in an office space, excuse me, and we're going to give that money to an office space so that we can feel safe where we worship together without feeling like we are not welcome. You have power to do that and you have the resources to be able to do that. When you, you think critically about the ways that you do matter, you are necessary for the masjid even if you don't feel like you are, even if you're made to feel like you're not, and how can you help them realize that? And at the end of the day, they may never realize that. And that's when you go back to point one, that you still go back to the masjid and you pray for the healing of yourself and your community. And maybe it's time to find a different masjid in your locality where you do still have that connection, but in a different place. Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> this question is a tough one. So I'm giving you a warning. And it's very practical, it's very common. So I'm gonna read it so I, I give it due right. How do we as women, especially getting married young and questioning both cultural and religious understanding of Islam, navigate the definition of qawama, 
that usually is explained as, quote unquote, wife has to be obedient in turn for financial support from husband. And that's, that's the extent of the role. What is the way we, as women, should understand this role men play, and what does it look like to obey as a wife? This needs a whole next... Uh, yeah, whole conference. No, I really mean this. This is going to be the next one, because we agreed that we're going to tackle every sensitive issue. Because if we are not going to be talking about it, who else is going to talk about it? Right? And we need to, in general, this is very difficult. There's a couple of things in Islam, and I'm saying this as a woman. It's very difficult on the woman. What is the second one? Very difficult. You don't see it in this country because it's not allowed. Polygamy. Yeah, when I was in Saudi, this was a huge issue because it's very hard for the woman. So, come to reality. Number one, you need to understand what is qawama and what is the requirement for qawama. In general, when I shared with you the story of Sayyidah Aisha, right? How did she respond? And there's nobody stronger than Sayyidah Aisha. If you, if you really read her biography, right? She stood up for her right, she speaks her mind, she acted as a wife, she was jealous, she planned. You all know this, right? Right? How did she respond? Was she an obedient wife? Answer me. No or yes? Yes. Was she weak? Was she submissive and let them say whatever they say? What can I do? You know, he, they, he, he pays for me. What did she do? Turn to Allah. This is what we are missing. I need to understand what is qawama. I need to understand where does qawama apply? Does Allah expect me to be the obedient wife? Yes, to a certain extent. It's not an open invitation. Otherwise, Allah knows our ability and our limitation. And marriage will be, honestly, almost impossible. But is it also exactly what you just said? Open invitation, no for everything, this is your mind. You know the 50-50 rule? You don't know the 50-50? I'm not going to say it in public. <laughs> Honestly. So we don't want to go to the extremes. Now you should probably know. It's, you shouldn't be the extreme. He does this, I does this. If he doesn't do it, I'm not doing it. That's not, that's not going to work. What? The hadith I had actually in my mind, but the time didn't allow it. That's the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu And you translate it as, as the following. The women are but partners of the, of the men. So here you go. What does it will take if I am going to give him the qawama? Because Allah told me, provided he is qualified to do the qawama. The 50-50, the joint uh, account, is not a qawama. You need to read the Qur'an. The qawama is because he spent on her. There's no 50-50. There is no joint account. If you are the richest woman, it's your money. If that's how it is in your home, then yes. You obey him as long as there's no disobedience to Allah. As long as there's no abuse. It's, it's not a yes and no right away, you know? The culture is telling us no, and the, we think Islam tells us yes, and that's where the conflict. You need to learn, and you need to be patient, and you need to navigate, and you need to put your mind, the goal after pleasing Allah, can I save this marriage? Can I be this woman? We need to have a lot of talk about marriage before they get married. The, 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 and I'm sure Dr. Uh, 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 Arania knows this, the percentage of divorce in the Muslim community is getting very close to the non-Muslim. It's 47%. I had a woman came to my house, knocked on the door, gave me the invitation, and says, please make dua. So of course I'm making, I said, please make dua, they stay married. Wallahi, I was like, subhanAllah. So, qawama, has a requirement from the man, has a requirement from the woman, is not do or don't. The other one, what does Allah expect from us, us, as obedient wives? 
toward the husband, Qawam, because we want to please Allah, but that usually gets dressed up in a cultural baggage, which is so true. And I'd like to understand the actual expectation to not feel guilty. This is definitely going to be our next, uh, yeah, because this is a long subject. So inshallah, if Allah allows, make dua, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows this to happen. This, by the way, was started in November in a simple conversation. And she said, really? I said, sure. And here we are, subhanAllah. And may Allah reward you for all coming because you made it reality. Jazakumullah khair. So inshallah, next time we will tackle another. She is, by the way, we have to uh, acknowledge, she was the one who wrote the descriptions. It was beautiful descriptions, really. Really, I mean, we talked about the subject, but exactly, you know, the best, the better, the equal. So may Allah reward. Um, so there was a question about um, just books in terms of like learning about women. There's the women around the Prophet ﷺ. There's a, if you want something that's deeply philosophical, the Tao of Islam, the source book on, no, oh, shoot, it, the Tao of Islam. It's, it's discussing a lot of the Sufi ideas of like, what does womanhood mean? Am I a woman in my soul? A lot of those discussions, she actually wrote it from an Eastern perspective because the Western perspective was apparently too difficult to, to work with where she was saying like, I, I would go through all of these discussions on like, you have to understand the Islamic ethos for you to understand how and why these rulings come about. And it was so difficult that she's like, I have to come, I have to literally cross the ocean, come from an Eastern perspective to be able to explain it. But I do want to say a lot, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I'm so grateful for female teachers. We have just as many female teachers in our communities as we do men. We just don't value their scholarship in the same way. We don't have a lack of this. And this is on every subject. Like I learned about like structural racism because I asked aunties in the masjid. I went to my aunties and I said, I, I know I'm at, like, also, when you make a mistake and someone schools you, thank you, thank them for the free education. Because I didn't, I didn't know things. I, di I didn't actually, for a good chunk of my life, I didn't live in America. I had no idea. And then I would like, wait, other sisters don't know this. Come to the halakha. <laughs> Please teach us. Because how are we going to support each other if we don't know each other? And we don't value the scholarship that we have. I just, I know I'm tangenting, but there was a discussion on polygamy. I think it's important for us to make sure that we are putting it again within, the, within its context. The Prophet ﷺ married a number of women after the Battle of Uhud. They lost 7% of their male population in a day. This was a devastating day. And the stories about the Battle of Uhud, it's very difficult to get through them with, with, without just sobbing. The companions' children, radiallahu anhum, would come out and call for their fathers and cry when they didn't hear a response. They knew what happened. So the Prophet ﷺ started marrying a series of widows. When you look at a community that's under attack, because you're living in peace, you don't judge a community that's living under attack. Communities at war are different from communities at peace. And I want to say this because polygamy in, in, in America is far more common within the black community than it is in the immigrant community. Because one in four black men between the ages of 18 and 28 is in prison or on parole. This is a community under attack. And this isn't to say it's a blanket statement. Not every woman will, is willing to live with it. Some women, regardless of their backgrounds. In, in Yemen, it's actually very common. Like my, my sister-in-law's neighbor was trying to find her husband, his second wife. She's like, I might as well like her. And I was like, this is the craziest thing I've heard in my life. Different cultures do different things. The women in Mecca were willing to accept it. The women in Medina weren't. The Prophet said, never insulted the women of Medina by taking more than one wife from Medina. It wasn't a part of their culture. And all of that is fine. We don't, I just want to make sure that we're not judging a community at war that is under attack the same way that we would judge a community in a place of peace. If Allah has gifted you something, alhamdulillah, don't look at your sister that's in a different situation and be like, oh, but I'm better. Ask her what that experience is like. She might enjoy her marriage far more than you ever dreamt of. And I've talked to some of these sisters. It's like, wow, yours sounds so amazing, alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Dr. Amina. 
All right, mashallah. This question, alhamdulillah, there's so, there's so many questions and so many beautiful questions. How on earth are we going to do this, this all before Maghrib? I have no idea. So we're going to do our best. We're going to consolidate, take another round of, one more round maybe before Maghrib comes in. It's tiny.cc backslash reimagined questions. Excellent, your neighbor has it, alhamdulillah. All right, alhamdulillah. This question here reads, some of the women that were mentioned today as examples can be viewed as anomalies. Okay, I love this, because as soon as I read it, I was like, aha, I knew somebody was gonna ask this. I knew somebody was going to say, oh yeah, yeah, I know, but those are the greats. Does this actually apply to me? So the question goes, or that they were women who were present in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, which is also a very common thing that people say. But they were Sahabiyat. Who are we? Okay, hang on. And we are not debating that they are the best of the generations. This is clear from the hadith. However, or, <laughs> then it continues, or they were Sahabiyat. Yes, okay, you got that. Or they were so special and better, in us, better than us that they are at a different level that we will never reach. How do we talk about this? I'll tell you exactly how we talk about this. The reason we decided in this, or at least in my talk, I decided to bring examples of the Prophet's wife and examples of the Sahabiyat was specifically because the topic itself had to do with the concept of, my topic was, stay at home. Do women, shouldn't women stay at home? And I was giving examples because people are going to say, is there proof in the Prophet's era that women did more than stay at home? I said, well, who better than the very woman of the Prophet's era, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his very wives, Ridwan Allahi Alayhin, to actually explain. But that does not mean that in all of Muslim history that there weren't so many examples. Sisters, you have to hear these stories and understand that there were so many of them, yani ubiquitous, to where these are not anomalies. They are not. And I'll tell you, and this is why I'm so happy to say that, because anytime I get to share about Damascus, I love it. <laughs> because for me, for me, I had to, the, the honor of being able to see this in real life. The people who are present, I don't know who was in the halak on Friday night a couple weeks ago. I got so frustrated, it's not with the sisters, but with the questions that people ask about, where are the female scholars? And I would explain and explain. And finally, I just said, you know what? I turned off my, my uh, green screen behind me and there was my bookshelf, right? And I just pointed at my bookshelf and I said, you see these shelves over here? You see these shelves behind me? There were rows and rows and rows of books. And I said, every single one of these is a modern, currently living, or just recently deceased, female scholar. You want fiqh, you want hadith, you want the qira'at of Qur'an, you want tajweed, you want sira, you want it, 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 everything. It's all right there on the shelf. And they were all women of Damascus in one place, one country. What if we added to it all the countries of the world? Allah, if what you said was so true, we may not know the women scholars, because sometimes they're the auntie who is in the community who you learn structural racism from, and nobody calls her doctor, ustada, blah, blah, <laughs> with honorific titles. But she has more knowledge on that topic than anyone else. Right? And then what about all of our teachers that actually have knowledge and either we don't know them, simply, the gems, the hidden gems of our community, or they ha don't have a platform, which is what Rahma Foundation is, a platform for all the women of Stadas to speak from. A whole, they don't have a whole organization backing them or masajid opening their doors to them. Or that simply, we are so used to, just like the question about the Quran apps, and listening to men who read Qur'an, beautiful recitations. We're so accustomed to listening to a man reciting Qur'an. We've never even heard a woman recite Qur'an. SubhanAllah, right? And so let me just tell you this. These are not anomalies. Back to the question. What I saw, SubhanAllah, was a beautiful story of balance. A story of women who had, if Allah blessed them with a spouse, were married. And from those who are married, if Allah blessed them with children, were mothers. But every single one of them, without exception, whether she was a wife or not, whether she was widowed or divorced, whether she was single or never married, whether she had children, 10 of them or one, they had one thing in common always. They were dedicated to the knowledge of Islam. 
They learned their Islam. These women, it doesn't matter. The, the primary level was they all had memorized the Qur'an. Every single last one of them had ijaz and Qur'an. And then there are those who went further up and memorized a hadith. And eventually got ijaz in the, all the books of hadith. And those who became the ten ashar qira'at of Qur'an. Right? And on and on and on. SubhanAllah. And we're not talking in the ones or ten, twenties or thirties anomalies. We're talking in the hundreds. It was a whole movement. It was beautiful. It still is. These are currently living people, though they may not all be in Damascus today, make dua for Syria and all of the countries of the Muslim world and the world by extension. The reason I'm sharing this with you, sisters, is because we tend to think of anomalies. Let me tell you, after I came back from studying in Syria, one of the trips back, I had actually spent so much time studying with women teachers, and at a young age, I was a teenager when I first started, I went to my first mixed, yeah, I mean mixed as in like, had like women were on one side and men were on the other side program. It was a month-long intensive dean program. And I was like, huh, this is interesting. <laughs> they were all male teachers. It's actually quite a funny story. <laughs> they were all male teachers. There wasn't a single woman teacher. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I'd never really heard too many male teachers speak, whatever. So each one was getting up and giving his lecture. Each one was getting up and giving his lecture. <laughs> and after like a day's worth of this, this shows you how naive and kind of silly. I was still very young. I'm sitting in the front row. The problem is I'm sitting in the front row. <laughs> And I listened to each of them, each of them, each of them. Okay, khalas, we have a whole day worth of male teachers speaking. Beautiful teachers, mashallah. And finally, I turned around to the sister sitting on this side of me and the sister sitting on this side, and I said, huh, how strange. They're all men. <laughs> and I said, you know, they're not so bad. They're just not as good as the women teachers. <laughs> And the sisters sitting next to me, I will not forget the look on their faces. They looked at me like, what planet did you just come off of that you know more women teachers and scholars that it's the weird anomaly that the male ones are speaking? And that was my reality. All of the women were teachers. All the, women were all the teachers that we had were women, subhanAllah. Scholars, scholars, alhamdulillah, Allah allowed me to keep going back to Damascus. I did study with the men and the shaykh as well of Damascus. Beautiful, mashallah. But something special about that. To where you can take a young kid and put her in a program and go, huh, oh, strange, male teachers. <laughs> mashallah, right? right? I had a friend, very similar, sorry, tangent here. But she had lived all her life overseas, and so her hockey team was all women, all girls in a Muslim country. And when she moved to Canada, they went to their first like official hockey game. And so, you know, when you, when you have the mask on and you're, everyone's playing, you can't see if they're a male or a woman, a man, a man or a woman. And so eventually they took their helmets off and she goes, oh, they're men. <laughs> exact same reaction. It depends what you saw. It depends what you grew up with. It depends what you were able, Allah gave you the ability to see. Sisters, these examples are not anomalies. They are more ubiquitous than we think. And they absolutely can and should and will be you and your daughters, inshallah ta'ala. And so there was another question that came into the, the chat that asked about the uh, exam that I talked about, the licensing exam. And so this one sort of, I'll just, it's a long one, just to ask about, um, the, the question is, is, is race, basically about um, racism and how I saw the lens of it when looking at it. I'm re-paraphrasing the question because it's a really long one. And about what, you know, if white people read the question and said, oh, it's exemplifying white people and they feel horrible about that on the exam as well. And so the, the writer um, talked about um, it's better to think about, basically about, um, but I think empower African American community comes from a place of talking about great things that, um, that have done a focus on the positive mental shift alongside strategically fighting against racism. And so basically I think the pe what I'm surmising from this is really focusing on um, the positives that happen within the African American community versus the, the struggles and the pain. Um, we need both. Okay, so we have to acknowledge the pain and the torture that happened in this country um, for over 400 years. That's a real thing. 
there is still suffering that comes because of enslavement and the torture that happened in this country for African American people and realize that those people were Muslim. Many of them that came over, you know, that were forced into enslavement were also Muslims. So we're reverting back. So it's not necessarily looking at the negatives of it. I think we need to look at both. Um, and look at the positives and the powerful achievements that has happened and hasn't happened, like, un, like Hidden Figures. We talk about some folks who saw that movie about the strength of women, um, and even like the sister was just speaking about many of the scholars. Many of the scholars with, that did a lot of the writing too um, also come from African countries as written in the language of Wolof, you know, and spoken in the language of Wolof. So we look at both. I think both is important. And, and we sit with ourselves and with our own souls about hearing and learning things that are painful and wanting it to go away and move past it. That goes back to what we talked about with race and neutrality. And that adds to another question that came in there and about cultural humility was another question that came in there. Cultural humility is the piece about you know, being humbled and learning what it is that we don't know. And, and moving ourselves to learn more and be humble about that. So we need both. Yes, there is the positive and the beautiful parts about African American history. And there is also the pain that is happening right now today. Because if we, if we are blind to it, then it adds to that piece about race and color blindness. And that becomes detrimental and very painful, whereas folks become also supporters of the oppression rather than those who are fighting against it. So it's, it's a combination of both. And I think I answered three questions in one. <laughs> I think I did, inshallah. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure, thank you. Perfect. All right, alhamdulillah. Thank you. So I had, um, and again, I, we apologize for not being able to get to all the questions. There's so many that I wish I could answer, but we just don't have time. So I'm gonna choose this one that I really think I can speak on because it relates to um, an experience that I actually lived through. So the question is, we understand that one can still have ostentation, right, which is riyat, it's a disease of the heart where you show off, right, you're, you're performing, basically, in order for it to be seen. Um, uh, that, that we can have ostentation when people purposely go out of their way to not look boastful. Do you still have ostentation if you go out of your way to not look too good around certain people? Uh, an example is where basically wearing a mask around men or purposely dress and purposely dress with not the best attire around certain people out of fear of judgment or being seen by them. So the question again that I'm hearing here is, is it still Riyadh if you're trying to basically, you know, kind of tone down your dress um, uh, so as not to attract uh, or to appear a certain way, right, to whether it's men or, or other uh, people. And uh, so I, I feel like this question, I just again can speak to it because many, many years ago, before I even knew what the term ostentation was, which is like a, you know, it's a mouthful of a word, um, or riya, we, I hadn't studied the diseases of the heart. I absolutely had it, I just didn't know I had it. But a big part of my focus was on the outward. And so wearing a certain clothes to not be perceived uh, you know, as, as attractive or, or just to look intimidating was absolutely my game. I went out of the house with the agenda to intimidate people, to look scary, to not be judged um, you know, for, for, a, for any physicality or anything else, um, and to send a message, a strong message. Um, and I thought that that was you know, something pious. I actually believed that it was an act of piety to do that. And I've told the story before, but I don't know how many of you have heard it, so I'll just quickly tell it because I think, it, for me, it was a life-changing moment for me, and it just made me, it helped me to shift focus. But I've told the story, so if you've heard it, you can leave if you want, <laughs> but I don't wanna. Uh, anyhow, I was, this was many years ago, and so as I mentioned, I used to dress like all, uh, kind of military style in a way, uh, head to toe black, and I would walk around, um, with like a grimace and just like not be very pleasant because uh, I wanted to intimidate people. So I was at the airport waiting for a ride and this, um, you know, I'm just sitting there, people watching, waiting for my ride, dressed again, head to toe like that. And a woman, she parks her car right across the street. I mean, uh, on the, you know, in the, in the, where, where all the cars are coming. And she parked her car and then she got, got out of her car and she's wearing a tank top and shorts 
And she's a you know white, I mean, I'm assuming white American woman, but she, um, she was dressed very scantily and I just immediately just judged her and had a lot of negative thoughts, let's just say. Um, completely judged her. And this happened to me. She closed the trunk of her car and she looked right in my direction as if she was piercing through my soul. And, you know, you make eye contact with somebody who you're just judging, you know that's not comfortable uh, if you've ever done that before. But she did that and then she walked directly towards me. And so as she's walking towards me, my heart is like, you know, because I'm like, what is this? This is kind of strange. Why is she coming towards me? And uh, wallahi, she did this. She came and she stood in her tank top and short shorts. And I'm sitting there, and she, she put her head down, and she said, Assalamu alaikum. Um, last words I ever thought I would hear from someone dressed like that. And she had so much humility. I actually, she had her head hand the, 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 low the whole time, pretty much she was talking to me. She's like, I know I'm dressed so um, inappropriately, but I am Muslim, and um, I want to raise my son Muslim, and I saw you, and I thought it was like a sign from God that I come and talk to you, because, um, I want books, she's like, I need resources for my son. So she's saying all this stuff, and I'm just sitting there like completely floored at what just happened, because I know the internal dialogue I was having in my head. And of course, Allah knows what I was thinking, and he sent this woman to me. He sent her to me to teach me a very, very serious lesson that day, which is, who do you think you are, right? You're walking around as though you are the personification of my faith, and you judge people and you think you're better than people. And that's who I was for a really long time. And that day I learned the lesson, I am nobody. Because that woman, I'm sure, was, was far better than I was in that moment. And I, I had to sit with that. And it was like a, um, I say it was, it was like a punch to, to the gut. It was, but it was a huge awakening for me that my focus was on the wrong thing. I was focused on the outward. So Ria is a disease of the heart where in both cases, where you do something to be seen, or you don't do something to not be seen, it is riya, because the focus is on people. Our focus has to be on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't act for, for to be seen or to not be seen, to be judged, to not be judged, to be accepted, to not be accepted. That is not the state of the believer, because people can't benefit you and they can't harm you. Everything is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the believer understands that, and that's why if you're going to dress a certain way, do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't factor in people. Do it for the sake of Allah, and He will give you tawfiq, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. I just wanted to share, since we only have one minute, um, I, won't have time to answer the, I won't have time to answer the actual question. So instead, I'd like to share something. Um, SubhanAllah, when we're talking about the you know, legacy of our amazing and incredible African-American brothers and sisters, I want you to know that we have a international Dubai Quran competition where every country of the world comes and competes. And we've had three winners from the United States, and all of them are African-American. SubhanAllah, we have Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar in spaces of Qur'an, which is where I do so much research, and women reciting Qur'an. MashaAllah, on the app that we have coming out, inshallah, we have women Qur'an reciters, so many from Nigeria, from Cameroon, from Guinea, mashallah, from the Gambia, and MashaAllah, their recitations are not just beautiful recitations, they're also reciting Qira'at. So you're gonna hear recitations you've never heard before and you don't understand. And I'm gonna have just play one of them for you, inshallah, as we end, just to give you a glimpse of the depth of knowledge. Because this isn't just, oh, I go to the masjid and I memorize it from hearing someone. The level of this knowledge is so powerful. And those of us who are not black, we have so much that we owe our brothers and sisters. Our brothers and sisters, how you so beautifully spoke to this. May Allah bless you to recognize the fact that we who, those of us who are not black, the privilege that we have, and also to recognize that the reason we have so much privilege is because of the sacrifices and the, 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 the pain of our brothers and sisters from the African American community. But the scholarship that we have from so much of East and West Africa is just so powerful in our, in our, in our history. So I wanna end because subhanAllah, listening to this, it will inshallah blow you away. This is Sheikha Zainab Zailani. She is a, like, mashallah, hafidha with so much, um, a, constantly, a constant winner of Quran uh, um, competitions. And I want you to hear something different than you may have heard before. I just, mashallah, there are so many of them, I need to get to her. Bismillah. <laughs> 
الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لكم دينكم ولي دين إباجة نصر الله والفتح ورأيت الناس يدخلون في دين الله أفواجا فسبح بحمد ربك واستغفر إنه كان توابا تبت يدا أبي لهب وتب Dr. Amina, in one minute, can you explain what just happened? Um, the first ayah? Just the, what happened to, why, why did she say all of those? Like, There's no bismillah rahman rahim between them. Yes, why did she say the last one and the first one? Because she's, she's connecting the two surahs. Sorry, I just, that, I was sucked into the rest of the teaching. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm I'm actually out of practice for my qira'at. But mashallah, like at the beginning of the surah, what she was doing was imala. So like the ja'a, ju'a, or ja'a, they're all different recitations. Sorry? Even that one, Mashal. Okay, actually, do you want to answer? Yeah, can you answer? Come to <laughs> no, no, Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Mashallah, so different types of recitation. So uh, some of the recitations, they have imala. And they don't say the, the word with fatah the way we say it in Hafs. So in Hafs we say Ja'a. But Ibn Zakwan says Ja'a. So he makes the Imara. So this is one of the, one of the ways that differ between the Qira'at. And uh, SubhanAllah, yani, uh, there are so many differences. And um, Imam Shatibi radiallahu an, um, collected all the differences in the Qur'an all the, uh, and he calls it huruf. So when you say harf, it means that it's read differently from one recital to another. Sometimes they agree on certain ones, sometimes they d differ. Some reciters say a nays. Uh, some of them make full ishba' for the mad. They would say, ida ja'a, six. Some of them say four. So it depends, it's a whole science. And mashallah, the more you learn about the Quran, the more you, you think that you know nothing. And actually, this is about all the sciences of Islam. SubhanAllah. Sorry? No, Bismillah. Some of the reciters, um, for example, Hamza radiallahu an, consider the Quran as a whole. So he doesn't read the best man. Some of them do six different ways, or five different ways, how to connect the surahs. So, for example, I'm going to answer this uh, in a little bit of detail. Let's take Waladdalin Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alif Lam Mim. So some of them would, the first rule is to separate the three uh, positions. They would say, وَلَضَّالِينَ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ أَلِفْ لَامِّيمِ You separate. Then what you do is you connect Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim to the beginning of the next ayah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim alif lam mi Longer. Meem. But you never connect um, when, uh, when you start the Quran, you never connect A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem to Bismillahir Rahman Rahim so that the one who doesn't know the Quran would not think 
that uh, Bismillah rahman rahim is the end of the first surah. So, and then you can connect all of them together and uh, some, some reciters also do sect between the two ayahs. Actually, the sect without Bismillah, so um, that's strong. Let's con uh, connect them together. Alif So different ways of reciting Hamdulillah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Thank you so much, Ansanihat. And, um, and speaking of, and this is a wonderful note to end on, I don't know if I still need this one, but a wonderful note to end on as we wrap up our conference, inshallah, is that um, the recitation, the 10 recitations of Quran, honestly, is something that is a science that we need to continue on. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if anybody here actually has worked on their Quran, worked on their hips, worked on their tajweed, Keep on working with the 10 Qur'at. And if this, I mean, we have to keep on putting the bar pretty, pretty high, mashallah, to keep on attaining it. I just want to end with saying one of the wonderful modern, like current day, um, I say modern, I mean current day, mashallah, uh, women scholars that I'm uh, very blessed, mashallah, to, to be aware of and to know of and actually study from her books is somebody by the name of Anse Samar al-Asha, who's written an amazing multiple volumes on the 10 Qira'at where she takes every single verse of the Qur'an and breaks down each and every one of the 10 Qira'at and tells you the differences. And then they say that there isn't actually a book, so many of her books are so unique, that there isn't actually a book quite like this. <laughs> that many people have been able to move from their Hafs of Qur'an to learning the 10 Qira'at because they were able to follow her method. She's also the same person, mashallah, she's memorized all the books of hadith and has books, an, an amazing book where she actually puts in, um, all it is is like for those who memorize all the hadith, imagine you don't just memorize the hadith, which is in itself an amazing feat. You also memorize the an'ana, which is like an so-and-so, an so-and-so, an so-and-so, right? Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the sanad, exactly. And she has these like shortcuts, which are all pictorial. <laughs> little picture shortcuts of how do you memorize all of the hadith and who was in the sun <laughs> right? of the sahih of the hadith. I mean, it is phenomenal, mashallah, and many, many books. There is a book that is translated of hers under the title Gatherings of Illumination by Dr. Faryal Salem, who translated the book, and it's a book of dua. So since we're entering into Ramadan, this is one you can go online onto Amazon and actually order it. And it's a beautiful book where she brings together the Quranic du'as and your hadith du'as of the Prophet Sallallahu and other du'as. And actually there's other compilations like this, but this one's done by a woman, mashallah. And it's a very beautiful compilation of du'as. So add to that to your library, inshallah. I end this, inshallah, with more inspirations. And by the way, she also ran the entire hadith school for women in Damascus, mashallah. I mean, this is beautiful. I met, uh, one more thing, I, I, I keep, keep on talking about her. She had students that would come from all over the world, and I met, <laughs> mashallah, our sheikh who gave us the ijazah in Quran and Tajweed, rahimahullah, um, he would have certain people who were given permission to give full ijazah. Because usually what you do in the ministry of Syria of the, of the, um, of, for the Quran is you have to go to the person with the shortest sanad, and there's only so many of them. And they were all men. And most of them wouldn't take on women teacher, women students. And subhanAllah, sometime maybe it was in the 70s or 80s or so, some of our teachers were able to finally ask and agree and convince. They actually went to the youngest of the five of the Qura of Sham. And he said, no, I don't teach women. They went to the next oldest, no, I don't teach women. They thought the youngest one would be more modern. <laughs> no, 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 no. Until they get to the eldest of them. SubhanAllah. And SubhanAllah, our teacher, SubhanAllah, the one we were blessed to receive ijazah from, took on students and, and hundreds. I'm talking about in the hundreds of, and then into the thousands of women who received the ijazah of Qur'an from Syria. And the, the Qur'an ijazah of Syria is the strongest and the strictest, so people would come from all over, even after they finished Qur'an elsewhere, to get the one from Syria. 
This teacher, Ansa Samar, that I'm telling you about, she had um, full permission to give the full ijazah on her own. Like, that's how strong her Qur'an was. And I met, mashallah, I will never forget this, one of the housemates I was, on one of my last trips was somebody from Turkey. And she finished that day her ijazah of Qur'an. She went to go get tested, and they give you this beautiful roll certificate of your ijazah of Qur'an with the whole sanad, and who the teacher was, who the sheikh was, and who the teacher was. And she was so excited, not only because she received the ijazah, but she said, look, look, on the very corner, it tells you what number, you know, because they issue, right? certificate, endowment-based uh, certificates with numbers. Which number are you? And these are in the thousands and thousands of these ijazas, mashallah. Hers said number one. Because hers was the very first given from Ansa Samar herself, from the woman <laughs> teacher, mashallah. Beautiful, beautiful, alhamdulillah. I hope to inspire you. These are all currently living amongst us women scholars. May Allah bless them and us. And I'm telling you, whether it's a sister from Turkey, or whether it's myself, or whether it's all of us, I think all of us would agree, or all of you, we're just ordinary people, folks. <laughs> we're ordinary people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed for and blessed, and you and us, inshallah, can be extraordinary in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes when you make the commitment, make the intention, and the door start opening, subhanAllah, and then be community and sisters for each other. Inshallah, with that, I'm going to end, and we'll have our Maghrib prayer together. There are a couple of housekeeping announcements to us I'll say after our ending here. Wa sallallahumma ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I want to thank you all for your time and your attention today. Alhamdulillah. And everybody who is online, welcome. And mashallah, we're so happy to have you. Please continue joining the Rahma Foundation and the Jannah Institute's programming all throughout the week and the months. And with that, my dear sisters, we'll close, inshallah, with our dua. Just La ilaha illa anta subhanak inna kunna min al-zalimeen. لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين اللهم لك الحمد اللهم لك الحمد اللهم لك الحمد حمدا يليق بجلالك وعظيم سلطانك ربنا أنت أنت ولينا وأنت مولانا ربنا إنك ترى مكاننا وتسمع كلامنا وتعلم سرنا وعلانيتنا ربنا لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إننا ظلمنا أنفسنا ظلما كثيرا فاغفر لنا غفرانا كثيرا فإنه لا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت سبحانك ما عبدناك حق عبادتك ولا قدرناك حق قدرك فاغفر لنا أنت الغفور الرحيم أنت الرحيم الودود أنت السميع القريب ربنا صلي وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه تسليما كثيرا ربنا ارزقنا اتباع سنته ربنا ارزقنا اتباع سنته ربنا ترزقنا اتباع سنته ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه تسليما كثيرا أمين